funny thing, Time. We used to daydream of places we'd go. But now we're making the most of the time we have and searching for the time of our lives. Taking the time to plan not just where we'll go, but when. Taking the time to wonder where we'll wander. Booking time for long lunches and winning wines. Making plans for great times or simply taking time out with the people you love. So take a little time for yourself to dream of time in New South Wales. Soon, the time will come to turn one day into two day. Take the time to love Sydney and New South Wales. The time has come to turn one day into today. Love, Sydney. <laughs> the nations of the world have streamed to Sydney to enjoy this piece of paradise. They have turned the dream of one day into a reality. They have reached the destination. Of course, we who live here are somewhat blinded to the blessings of our city. Maybe they're a bit too up close. The stunning natural beauty of the beaches and harbour. On a sunny Saturday, we often take our kids to the Wentworth Point Ferry Wharf and get the ferry to the city with no real destination in mind, just enjoying the majesty of the river and harbour. And as you get closer to the city, the impressive buildings which crowd around, seeming to jostle for a taste of the glory of the harbour. Then about an hour that way, the crisp, clean air of the mountains, the ancient rock forms, the cascading valleys, world-class walking tracks, streams and waterfalls. We've got theatres and opera houses, museums, libraries, galleries. We've got world-class sporting facilities on our doorstep where the best in the world play before us. State-of-the-art medical facilities, world-class universities, cutting-edge research. And even the coffee's okay. It's got to be close to the best you can get. No, you haven't walked in to a tourism New South Wales pitch. You're at church. And I'm painting the picture of this great city because I want us to ponder a question today. What does living in a city like this do to you? I wouldn't trade it for the world, the blessings we have here. But think about this. How does living in a place like this change the way that you think? Does it give you an overconfidence in the security of your future? Does it give you an overestimation of what you actually deserve? Does it quench your hope for a better day? as you live the dream here and now? Does it dull your senses to the God who gives every good gift? In today's passage, Isaiah 2, we see this city, Sydney, is in danger, terrible danger. A city without God is a city in trouble. God's vision for the city is what matters. And he gives it to us in the book of Isaiah. So we're going to look at Isaiah and see his vision of two cities and decide today which city, which city will you choose? Now, just as we start, I want to stop and marvel a little bit at what I'm suggesting we do here. Remember last week in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, we saw that this is an ancient vision from two and a half thousand years ago. 
a vision regarding Judah and Jerusalem when those kings ruled back in the 8th century BC. Here we sit in the 21st century AD in one of the world's most advanced high-tech cities, high achieving, and now we look back to Judah for the vision of the city we need. Isn't this remarkable? Or perhaps a bit of a stretch. Even in those days, Judah was very insignificant and small on the scheme of the world. I have a book that records hundreds of inscriptions that have been dug up by archaeologists from the Assyrian Empire, Assyria being the superpower of those days. And in these inscriptions dug up from the ground, one or two mention Judah. See, no one looks to Judah and Jerusalem, even back in those days. Why should this vision for a few hundred thousand citizens of Jerusalem two and a half thousand years ago shape our vision for the city today? Well, it might be a small city in the world's eyes, but it's a big vision in God's eyes. To start Isaiah again, back in chapter 1, Isaiah says, Hear me, you heavens! Listen, earth! Heaven and earth are ordered to sit down and pay attention to what Isaiah has to say. This is a cosmic vision, huge, with universal implications. The vision of this city has implications for all of heaven and earth, all of history, not just those days, but these days, and even the last days of the earth. We see it when we come into chapter 2, as we do today. Did you notice how chapter 2 begins? Very much like the start of chapter 1. See it? It's introduced as what Isaiah sees, his vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem again. But this time it's not a vision of Judah and Jerusalem in the 8th century BC. It's a vision of Judah and Jerusalem at the end of the world. When? Look in verse 2, the last days. The days when God will come in the end to finally act. See, Isaiah swings from chapter 1 to chapter 2 between two poles of history. It's a comprehensive vision, and it focuses on what? Jerusalem. Little Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center of God's plans for the world. How remarkable this is. So let's take a look at two cities. First, the ultimate city. And let's highlight three things in these first verses of Isaiah 2. It's an exclusive city. It's higher than all the rest. Verse 2. The mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. Now, this isn't telling us to all go move to the mountains. It's not a statement about the godliness of living at altitude. We love our coast. But mountains, the high places, they were considered to be the places where heaven and earth meet. If you want to get close to heaven and God, where do you go? Up. The mountain. And so the nations around Israel had their high places where they had shrines and altars to meet with their gods. But Isaiah here looks to one day when one holy mountain will stand supreme above all the others, reducing all the others to utter insignificance. People travel the world these days looking for religious experiences, visiting temples and sacred ruins, seeking mountaintop experiences. There is only one holy city rising above the rest, 
because there is one God, one holy God as we have sung, our God. The mountains of all the other gods and nations, Isaiah calls them hills. Katoomba would be an anthill. Jerusalem is the highest high place because it's the place where the true God lives, the God of heaven and earth. Jerusalem, this ultimate city, is exclusive. But second, it's inclusive. See the end of verse 2. All nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. Jerusalem is exclusive. There is one mountain standing above the rest, but it's inclusive. Everyone is welcome. In the 8th century BC, we heard last week, Assyria is rising and streaming down towards Jerusalem with plans to overcome it. How comforting the words of Isaiah to Jerusalem in those days. If only they would believe them. There will come a day when Assyrians will stream to Jerusalem not to overcome it, but to be a part of it, along with people from all nations of the world. It will be a truly multi-ethnic city. The ethnic backgrounds of the people will be recognised and celebrated in this city. The one God welcomes all peoples there. And third, it is a city of peace. See, this is an inclusive, multi-ethnic city, but it's not multicultural in the same way. What I mean by that is there is one cultural, one culture in this city, one agreed way of living for everybody. And it's the best way, because it's God's way. Look what the nations say as they head for Jerusalem. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. See, what is most beautiful and attractive about this city? What is it that draws the nations of the world to abandon their gods and come join in here? It's ruled by God. A place where people will walk in his paths. And that is true peace. In multicultural Sydney, we value tolerance, which actually means that under the surface, we can't agree on our governance. We can't agree what's right and wrong and how we should live here. We all live in different ways. We live in the same place, but with deep divisions inside. See, tolerance means living together with differences. And Sydney might appear peaceful, but actually we find it very hard to get along here. We have high fences. We barely speak to our neighbours. Our city's peace in light of God's city is a delusion. Under the surface here, there is suspicion and self-protection and doubt about our neighbours. You see it in our immigration policy. Our government seeks to balance our culture by watching and numbering the people who come to be a part of this. And in a broken, sinful world, there is wisdom in that. But it's a far cry from the immigration policy of heaven, where all nations freely enter. God will judge between the nations. All disputes will be settled. Verse 4. There's no need for billion-dollar defense budgets. No submarine deals. We won't even store up weapons just in case. There'll be no more suspicion, no more doubt, no more tolerance. See that wonderful 
picture, this famous description of the city in verse 4. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. See, this is true, lasting peace. All nations, one culture, one way under God. As we see Isaiah's vision of this ultimate city, pay attention to the common thread in these three things. God. It's an exclusive city because there is one God. It's an inclusive city because that one God is a loving and welcoming God. And it's a peaceful city because he will govern it with justice. And everyone will see his way is best. This is the ultimate city. Jerusalem, the city of God. Well, the rest of the chapter goes on to show the other side. Another city. What the Jerusalem of Isaiah's day had become. And to me, it looks a lot like Sydney. Man-made cities rely on man, not God. We build up cities, but we build out God. Man makes cities to make a name for himself. It's the pattern since the Tower of Babel. Just look. Look at the sorry state of Jerusalem in verse 6. They are full of superstitions from the east... They practice divination like the Philistines and embrace pagan customs. Their land is full of silver and gold. There's no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There's no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. Jerusalem the holy city of God. What has it become? They have abandoned God and turned to man-made strength and security. And this is a major theme we see throughout the book of Isaiah. When the pressure is on, Jerusalem turns not to God, but alliances with man, the nations. And we see that influence in this description, superstition, divination, pagan religion, a different mosque or temple or house of worship on every street corner, pick and choose from the religious smoggers board, do it yourself, man-made religion. And notice on the outside, everything looks pretty good. Looks like things here are going well. It looks respectable, pluralistic, you could say, rich, prosperous. Verse 7, silver and gold, treasures, horses and chariots, a strong economy, not too many Toyotas left in town, Audis and Lexuses. People basically having the money to buy anything they want, everything they want. Purchases moving well beyond necessity into luxury. When things are like that, you tend to feel confident, don't you? When there's nothing you need that you can't acquire... And you can even start to pay others to do the things you'd prefer not to do. You feel safe, secure. 
But verse 8 says, the land that is so full of wealth is equally full of idols. The people worship what they have made, what they have acquired, what they have bought. Jerusalem was God's city that had turned to man, not God, and had become like the nations of the world. And I hope you have not missed the echoes of Sydney today. Man-made cities rely on man, not God. And so, verse 6, God abandons them. These cities won't last. The consequences are very serious and hard to imagine in a city like this. For the Jerusalem who failed to be the Jerusalem of God, and for the Sydney who fails to recognize the true and living God, a day is coming when these proud man-made cities will crash. Look at verse 12. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty. The arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Isaiah says a day is coming, a day of judgment, when God will come and act. And the pride of man will be brought low. And just look at the things in verses 13 to 16 that will come crashing down on that day. The tall trees, the towering mountains, the high hills, the natural wonders that God has made but that we claim and use as if they are our own. Our harbour and river and mountains and every lofty tower and fortified wall, every great ship, every great expression of power and prestige, everything that human beings are impressed by will be seen in right perspective on that day. This is confronting, friends. This is our city See, what do you think the splendor and glory of human prosperity will look like on that day? The things we hold on to, the things we put around ourselves, what will they look like in the face of the splendor, the fearful majesty of the Lord? Verses 10 and 11 and 19 and 21 to 21 frame around this section and they describe exactly what it will look like. Try to imagine it, friends. This city around us, the neighbors on your street, frightened people fleeing to clay, caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground, trying to hide. Throwing away their idols, their useless wealth to rodents and bats. What a terrible picture. Remember this terrible day when God rises to shake the earth. That day... It's the same day of the end times in verse 2 when the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established and lifted up as the highest of the cities. You see why we need Isaiah's vision. One city is going up, one city is going down. But what can we do? We live in Sydney. We're part of a godless, man-made city destined for destruction. 
What does Isaiah suggest we do from here? Should we all move to the country? What does the passage teach us? Well, two things quickly to finish. Look at verse 22. Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? Man made cities will crash and burn. And yet, so often we let our culture, our whole way of life, be shaped by the city around us. Our hopes, our dreams, what fills our hearts and our plans, our security, our confidence. Friends, stop trusting in mere humans. who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? And as we stop trusting in mere humans, what then, how then do we live? Well, those who belong in God's heavenly city are identified by the way they walk. It's very clear in this passage. To faltering Judah, who are stumbling two and a half thousand years ago, Isaiah urges them, Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And the nations, Sydney siders heading up the hill to that heavenly city in the end, will say, He will teach us in His ways so that we may walk in His paths. God's heavenly citizens are marked by their walk. We walk in his ways. Our culture comes from God. Have you lived for that city? Is that your culture? We have all lived for this city. We have lived for man and what we can make for ourselves. We, the proud, are the ones who deserve to be thrown down. One man, Jesus, always walked in the light of God's ways. One man, Jesus, transforms our walk. See, remember what happens on that day. That day when God comes to act and bring judgment. Well, it's happened. What happened on that day? When the arrogance of man was to be brought low and the Lord alone was to be lifted up. When Jesus came, God's Son went down for the arrogance of humanity. When he should have been lifted up, he was lifted up on a cross to cleanse us, forgive us, and transform us so that we can walk his way. 1 John 2, verse 5 and 6. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. See, Jesus is the one who changes our hearts and our minds. He changes our walk. He enables us to walk as his citizens. When you see Jesus and trust him, you love him. You become like him. You can't help it. You start to walk as he did in the way of love. The man-made cities of our world are passing away. Thank God for Isaiah's vision of the perfect heavenly city. Thank God for Jesus who we follow and walk his way, the way of God. 
Friends, let us walk in his paths. Let's pray. Our great God, we thank and praise you for Jesus. We thank you that he came and was thrown down for all the arrogance and pride of our human hearts. Thank you that he has been lifted up and exalted now because of his obedience. He walked your way. And thank you that we can see him and know him and follow him and walk like him. We thank you for your great heavenly city of Jerusalem. We thank you that we can walk in as the nations because of his cleansing blood. Our Father, please help us in this city with such pride and arrogance and godlessness. Please help us to walk your way as we follow Jesus. And please help us to bring those around us with us and say, come, let us walk in his ways. Our Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful vision of Isaiah. In Jesus' name, amen.